as we all know that this is the last week of uh, the christian calendar year called the christ the king sunday why this sunday is called christ the king sunday and uh, we are so good we just few steps are ahead so we went and we have celebrated advent also but christ the king sunday is a very important sunday one of one of the very important sundays in christian calendar why this christ christ the king sunday was celebrated that is very important for us to know during the early 20th century especially 1916 uh, onwards 1920s russian russian revolution has taken place during this time in mexico russia and some parts of europe uh, this communism was growing so very fast and communists are secular in those days communists are very secular and they were threatening the church and whoever are sympathetic towards church people who ever are going to the church both in the major groups catholic in protestant and orthodox groups so there was so much so many threatenings so much fear was going around by the russian revolution and because of these uh, uh, militantly secularized regimes especially we can think about uh, the regime of uh, stalin in russia stalin banned the churches and he put so many restrictions uh, in russia all people cannot go to the church and worship only he allowed elderly people who are not able to do anything much physically who could not make much impact like you know uh, retired people he was allowing only those people to go to church and pray i heard a story uh, during those days there was a old lady who went to went into the church and uh, uh, which was fully guarded by these um, russian soldiers and this old lady boy went to the crucifix and he was kissing the foot of jesus so as she was kissing the foot of jesus a army officer has seen her and he came to her and as soon as she saw uh, army officer she was she was not uh, uh, troubled but the officer thought this lady would get scared of her like scared of him but there is no fear in her eyes and he asked her uh grandma grandma do you kiss the foot of stalin because he is the king those days he was the dictator she said oh certainly i don't mind kissing the foot of stalin if he also dies for me as jesus died that was her faith though she was going through so much of uh, uh, oppression suppression outside her heart was completely devoted to the king jesus she understood jesus is the king uh, no matter who ever is in the government jesus is the king he rules the king that's why she didn't have any fear and during this time looking at these atrocities that were happening and the persecutions that were happening in order to strengthen the faith of christians in order to rebuild rekindle the fear hope of christians pope uh pious then 11 he declared this sunday as the christ the king sunday reminding all the christians that christ rules over everyone no matter what is happening around us christ is the king and everything is in his control he wanted to give that confidence uh, to the people and even if we look at uh, look around ourselves what can we see we can see persecutions everywhere even in our own country we can witness the minorities how their rights have been uh, uh, violated they were not given freedom to practice their own faith in so many places we can witness these stories recent stories of northeast they are so terrifying and the so many of such stories we can hear even in middle east and if you look at the look the world around us especially as christians we can see persecution and next thing we can see uh well, next thing we can see uh, is wars can you see the red portions in the map 
uh, red portions here, something is cutting. Actually, uh, almost 30% of the world was uh, is already engaged in war. There are, I heard like there are 19 wars going on in the world. Even in the message, President Greg Williams, uh, he made a record of it. He said that, he mentioned that there are so many wars are going around us. In these kind of times, it is very important for us to understand that Christ is the King and not to lose our hope and put our hope in Jesus Christ. So, the solemnity reminds us about Christ's power over everything so we can depend on Him. So, Christ the King Sunday, okay, I gave the introduction about it. Oh, I believe Christ is the King of the world, King of everything. But let me ask you a personal question. Uh, as we were singing some songs today, I felt more like, you know, we, we are more concerned and to accept that Jesus is the King of our hearts. We spoke a lot in GCA about Jesus being the King of our hearts. Okay. Today, I'm not going to talk in those lines. Jesus is the King of our hearts. I know this. Is Jesus king of your world? I'm not talking about your personal world. Is Jesus also the king of the world? That's where we need to have a perspective to understand what does it mean to say that Christ the king? Is he truly the king of the world or not? Or how is he going to establish his kingdom? That's the reason I ask you to answer the question, what comes to your mind the moment you think about a cop uh, apocalypse? And uh, uh, it's surprising to see the word hopeless. Hopeless. Christians, we are talking about it. For Christians, is apocalypse hopelessness? We are, are we celebrating the coming of Jesus? Are we celebrating? We celebrate the first advent of Jesus. Are we celebrating the second advent of Jesus? Many of our answers, they... I'm, I'm not blaming anyone. Kindly, don't take my... I'm not talking to anyone personally. I'm just talking uh, in terms of faith and uh, spirituality only. When we talk about coming of Jesus, our hearts were supposed to be happy and celebrating because the Lord is going to come. Instead of that, our hearts are filled with fear. That does not mean you don't have faith. That means we may be having some wrong perspectives of apocalypse and wrong perspective about how Jesus is going to establish his kingdom even through the apocalypse. It has nothing to do with the amount of faith we have. Having said that, I saved myself, so uh, I can go into the sermon. The scripture we have read, no, sorry. Uh, the scripture we read was from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses uh, uh, 1 to 16. He, this is a prophecy. Ezekiel was prophesying. He was prophesying during uh, uh, the first exile. Ezekiel was one of the people, one of the prophet, prophets who was taken uh, into Babylon. Uh, Babylon captured Israel. And then in the first group, first batch, Ezekiel also was taken to Babylon. And this prophet, he is prophesying and saying, For thus says the Lord, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out uh, his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on the cloudy and dark day. So these are people scattered, people go, taken into exile means the, the Jewish people were being scattered. There he is prophesying. God is saying, I myself am going to come and I am going to gather my Sheep, I am going to search for my sheep. Don't be worried where you are going to be scattered. But I am going to search and bring you back. And he says, And I will bring them out of the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the inhabitants, inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be 
on the high mountains of Israel they they shall lie down in uh, there they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel i will feed my flock and i will make them lie down says the lord god i will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick but i will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment we all know very well from here that jesus is the good shepherd and god he is going to come and gather his sheep here it is not like the picture is the words of sheep and the shepherd are used but the picture here is king and his subjects king and his people the jewish always if you read the old testament you will find whenever god wants to talk about his relationship with the people or when he wants to talk about king and the uh, subjects he will be using the analogy of shepherd and the sheep why god uses this analogy because we all know very well the primary profession of jewish people from generations was shepherds jewish people were shepherds you do you remember what happened in exodus book of exodus jacob was so joseph went to egypt and settled down and jacob and they, his children they moved to israel and they were play not israel egypt and they were placed in a very green place because they were shepherd and all israelites they were hating them because these are shepherd these are dirty people that's how egyptians used to look at uh, israelites so these israelites were shepherds from the beginning so they can relate to the kind of connection god wants to explain to them the, and the kind of relationship god was expecting from between king and his subjects is the kind of relationship between shepherd and the sheep that is what he wanted and we all can witness in the history from the shepherd king itself do you i guess you know what i'm talking about the shepherd king david from his time onwards did any of these kings acted like shepherds all these kings none of them acted like shepherds they acted like thieves and robbers none of them took care of their fold properly they did not take care of them well they massacred them they killed them they looted them including david including david none of them they were good shepherds so they in that context god is saying i myself now i am not going to send any shepherd i myself i am going to come as a shepherd during the time of saul first king we know israel rejected me as their king that is the word god said and now he says i myself i am going to the people i am not going to send anybody and he says i'm going to gather them and i'm going to heal the broken and i'm going to uh, feed them and i'm going to take care of them and this is the kind of kingship god wanted to offer to the people and the same analogy the same kind of picture jesus christ has taken same language he has taken and he spoke in john chapter 10 verse 7 to 10 here also he is talking about the kingdom then jesus said to them again most assuredly i say to you i am the door of the sheep all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not hear them i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture the thief does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy but i have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly jesus is before come whoever came these are the thieves who did come before jesus most of the time we think it's talking about prophets it's not talking about prophets it is not talking about any spiritual leaders there it is talking about the kings of israel it is talk how they looted them how they robbed them how they destroyed them and jesus lit, uh, as he is speaking these words literally he was pointing to some people you know who the false messiahs who have come during the time of jesus 
there were so many false messiahs who claim and said they are the anointed ones they used to have prophets uh, prophesying for him and people were following and they were revolting against roman uh, government and most of those not most all of those revolutions which have started they were destroyed jesus having them in mind <coughs> he said whoever came before me are the thieves robbers and they come to steal destroy that's all they are going to bring death and not only jesus he who said this in book of acts we can find we can find some names also gamaliel we all know very well gamaliel said these words uh, when peter and john they were preaching and christianity was growing very fast and uh, this is what gamaliel said for some time ago theudas rose up claiming to be somebody somebody means messiah a number of men about 400 joined him he was slain and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing he is one of the false messiahs this um, gamaliel is pointing israelites to and then after this man judas of galilee rose up in the days of the uh, census what is what are these days of census the birth of jesus during the birth of jesus this man came judas of galilee and drew away many people after him he also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed so what gamaliel was saying was the question was so many movements are taking place so many people are claiming that they are messiahs all these people brought violence and they were destroyed and jesus claimed to himself to be messiah if he is a true messiah his movement goes if he is a false messiah they also will be destroyed that's what gamaliel was saying so however what we wanted to find from this is there are already so many messiahs there who were bringing violence into this world and uh, they did not bring salvation to them they did not heal them the kind of relationship they had was not shepherd and the sheep that's why god says i myself i'll go and i am going to shepherd my sheep why am i saying this because there is a great resemblance with that i'm not just talking about uh, the judas of galilee i'm not talking just talking about theudas and uh, david and all these kings on look at our own situation now look at this even the story of israel any country story what are the kind of kings we got what are the kind of leaders we got what are the kind of politicians that led our nations did any of them led us towards peace did any of them lead led us towards the healing of the nations or that just waging wars and they are bringing more and more violence into this world they are killing people and robbing people <coughs> uh, and we all know very well there is people say the so many conspiracy theories for their own benefit they don't mind putting millions of people lives in jeopardy is it not true in the history this everywhere it is true even today even today we can witness most of the high leaders of nations and after the retirement only we'll come to know about their scams okay and they say they'll tell how they looted and how they massacred people and these are the people go for war who dies common people i'm think i'm i'm having i'm speaking this having israel in mind israel and palestine also in mind many ask me even in my some relatives of mine only ask me should we christian support israel we are christians we should support israel many say okay and one particular uh, you know i found a um, post where it is written, the people of israel plead for your help so please donate these campaigns also are going on they forgot they have their elder brother america funding them enough <laughs> uh, anyway i'm not my interest is not into politics but look at should we christian support israel in the war i'm not here to find answers for that 
but what i would like to tell is this whoever the leaders came into this world they are bringing forth violence either it can be from israel or it can be from palestine or from any nation and god he is talking about uh, why am i connecting this to this modern day war is because many people interpret this scripture ezekiel chapter 34 verse 15 as a fulfillment which happened in 1970 Uh, 5 or 72 i guess which is which is ezekiel chapter 34 verse 15 i will feed my flock and i will make them lie down says the lord i will seek what was lost and bring back what was given away i am going to bring all my sheep back to israel and they say it is the, the fulfillment has taken as the israel nation was formed all the scattered jews they have, they have come back now the fulfillment has already taken place so jesus is going to come and going to establish his kingdom is it not that is it not these these are the apocalypse teachings book of revelation explanations we hear am i right that is the reason i have taken this scripture so people israel has come together and whatever uh, whatever happens this fu- this fulfillment has taken now god jesus is going to come no matter what kind of violence takes place christians have to support them because this is this can turn up to be the third world war where uh, you know this is going to be the end of the world this is going to be the doomsday and this is going to be the apocalypse and jesus is going to come back and support israel and kill the remaining palestinians and arab arabs and the other nations and establish israelite kingdom is it not the picture many christians have i am speaking explicitly that's why many may feel uncomfortable but most of the christians they have this kind of picture the apocalypse jesus is going to come back and going to do war against antichrist right who is the antichrist we have our own speculations and whose side jesus is going to take he is going to take the side of israel and how the apocalypse is going to be it's going to be as you ex- explained so who is executing the violence here jesus is also executing the violence here so but little moment we'll look into that uh, is jesus going to execute violence to establish his kingdom in order to understand we need to go to revelation chapter 7 and 19 revelation chapter 7 verse 9 onwards after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations tribes people and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to god who sits on the throne and the lamb all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures uh, and fell on their faces before the throne and worship god saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our god forever and ever amen this is what happening the angels and 24 elders and all people of all nations they were worshiping the one who is sitting on the throne and the lamb and they were worshiping the blessing and honor glory and power belongs to him and when is it happening we understand that it is happening right after the seven years of tribulation time Seven years tribulation time is there. During that time, Antichrist is going to be powerful, and Jesus comes and he is going to wage war against Antichrist. Antichrist is going to wage war against Israel, and Jesus takes the side of Israel and going to establish his kingdom. Then, verse thirteen onwards, it is written. Then one of the elders answering, saying to me, "Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from?" And I said to him, "Sir, you know." so he said to me these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation i'm just trying to put the context that's the reason i'm reading this this is what happening after the tribulation uh these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb it is something so interesting to hear and here the, this man is saying these people washed their robes in the blood and they have become white can any cloth <coughs> dipped in blood <coughs> becomes white nothing no clothes dipped in blood will become white it is talking about jesus and jesus blood is the only blood in this world which can clean everyone's clean everyone 
clean everyone's sin okay therefore they are before the throne of god and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them and they shall neither hunger uh, they shall neither hunger any more nor <coughs> nor thirst any more the sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water and god will wipe away every tear from their eyes can you see the sheep and the shepherd connection here also jesus god is continuing the sheep and shepherd connection in ezekiel taking the same thing in john and bringing the same thing into revelation as well here it is a picture where god jesus he came and the seven years tribulations are over and he is being seated on the throne and people are worshiping him that's what we can see but how did he defeat the antichrist and how did the war go the that, that description is not there in book uh, chapter 7 how did jesus face the war we don't know it is not clear it is it is not seen these are the people they came out of tribulation and here's the king who is sitting in the throne sitting on the throne and there is going to be glorious kingdom this is a picture john explains but what happened between the seven years and this throne enthronement is not very clear this is a worship happened after jesus established his kingdom in order to understand this we need to look at revelation 19 because these two are parallel uh, i know it must be a little heavy wow, what am i seeing but i'm just trying to take your attention to only one thing think about apocalypse how jesus is going to establish his kingdom okay and this is a description then i saw uh, this this is uh, about war how the war took place okay uh, verse 17 then i saw beast and his armies were defeated in this then i saw angel standing in the standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together for the supper of the great god that you may eat the flesh of the kings and flesh of captains the flesh of mighty men the flesh of hearts horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave both small and great and i saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the hearts and all the birds were filled with their flesh what kind of picture we get how the war took place what kind of picture we get feel free to respond that would be helpful <laughs> massacre hmm. any other thoughts how was the picture violent very violent picture it looks like that. but it it appears like violent because of that we answered all violent answers but in reality we are missing some things in this scripture also here we did not see anybody be anybody killing anyone he came and he put this antichrist these people came to war against the king they came to war against the man who is on the horse and he put them in the lake of fire the rest of of them are there they, uh, they a sword came from his mouth and killed them all okay <coughs> looking at this we think jesus also is going to wage a war which is going to be very violent my question always this if violence is the solution for violence uh telugu film actors would do much better telugu movies will make better why should we look for jesus huh all heroes there all movies they end violence with violence 
if Jesus also going to bring violence with violence, what is the hope for the sword nation? We all know that bringing violence against violence is not going to stop violence. It is going to add more violence. Violence is not the solution for it. And I was not able to understand reading book of Revelation. It looks so violent here. How? You know, even Christianity is speaking. Violence is going to restore the kingdom of God. Have you ever thought about it? We all Christians say Jesus is going to come back. And why are we scared? The first moment, let me ask you this question. Why are we scared the moment we say Jesus is coming? We are scared of the violence, isn't it? We are scared that we may be left behind. That is also there. We put our faith in Jesus. Of course, I don't want to talk about your faith. But what are we believing? Why are we scared? Because we got wrong pictures. We believe Jesus also is going to bring violence into this world. My logical questions are this. Uh, if Jesus also is going to bring forth violence to eradicate violence, what is the point in him telling us, love your enemies? What is the point in Jesus telling us, you know, forgive your enemy 70 times 7? Means unlimited, right? He who commanded us to forgive our, uh, forgive our brethren 70 times 7, will he not forgive these people? He who commanded us to forgive forever, always, any infinity times, will he not do that? Or he who said, you know, you, if your friend asks you to walk for a mile, walk for two miles. If somebody be, uh, takes your shirt, give the uh, you know overcoat also. In, I'm just, just speaking in a contemporary language. Will he do? What will he do? Will he? If somebody brings a sword, is he going to bring AK-47 and kill all? That is the picture we are getting about Book of Revelation, isn't it? These people may bring nuclear weapons and Jesus is going to bring the asteroids and throw them on the earth. That is a literal picture most of the Christians have for the revelation. None of these armies can win God because they may have nuclear weapons. God have asteroids. Right? No. If you choose violence as a means to bring peace, let me tell you, the means are going to become our end. Violence in order to bring peace cannot be justified. It can be Israel war, it can be India-Pakistan war, it can be any other war. Violence is not the solution. And for we Christians, we can never support violence. And even, why am I saying that? Because even God doesn't support violence. Jesus is the God whom we are worshipping. He received violence and he stopped it there. Jesus who was persecuted during his crucifixion. He can call his father who can send legions and destroy the armies. You know the conversation I'm talking about, right? But he didn't do that. Why? Because he knows violence is not the solution for violence. All around us is violence. And how Jesus is going to establish with violence? No. But then how is he going to establish his kingdom? Yeah, how is he going to win the war with the Antichrist? That also we need to know, no? Because that's where we got confused. Some kind of violence have to come. Some kind of asteroids have to come. In order to understand, we need to read Revelation 19. We read till now from 17 onwards to 21. Now we read 11 to 17. What is there? Revelation 19, 11 onwards. Now I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Who is this person? We are talking about one of the horsemen. The four horsemen came, they brought violence. He is the fifth horseman. And how this fifth, uh, his fifth, this fifth horseman is called faithful and true. And uh, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. In righteousness, he is going to judge and he is going to make war. Violence is not righteous way of war. He is going to make war with righteousness and 
justice his way his eyes were like flame of fire and on his way on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew except himself he was clothed with a robe dipped in the blood he is wearing a red cloth which is dipped in the blood and his name is called the word of god who is this last horseman the word of god and the arm is in heaven clothed in fine linen he is in red these armies are in white we'll come back to it okay uh, the linen white and clean followed him on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of fire what weapon is he using the sword that is going from his mouth he is not using asteroids he is not using nuclear weapons he is not using stars he is not he is not going to throw stars onto the earth not moon onto the earth not uh, any asteroids onto the earth he is going to use the sword that comes from his mouth can you tell me what that sword would be the word of god what god is going to do is how jesus is going to establish his kingdom is not with violence but his with his sword that comes from his mouth that is the word of god word of god is a double edged sword it cuts our hearts and our intentions and our thoughts it goes deep into it and it changes so how jesus is going to establish his kingdom even after tribulation is it through blood shedding i can say it is through convincing convicting the people's heart so i don't think the violence jesus is going to bring again to become the king again because he has already become a king by receiving the violence i told you there are here this king this person his clothes are red dipped in the blood right do you know whose blood is that if you read this just like with the old minds whose blood is this he is going to kill all the people right these many people are died his clothes will be wet with the blood but it is not so if you read with this context we understand his clothes are dipped in the blood whose blood the blood of jesus his own blood his own blood was shed on his clothes because of which there needs there is no necessity for violence outside in other words the war is going to be in such a way they are going to throw their arrows against him and his clothes are going to become red with his own blood and his word comes from his mouth and convicts those people just like how it is how the word of god convicted the thieves how uh, the officer roman officer was convicted at the cross crucifixion of jesus christ i cannot imagine jesus coming and executing violence and establishing his kingdom he is going to establish his kingdom with his own word and why am i saying this here only it is only description of the man is there uh, but he did not war like that no let's go back to what we read before verse 21 in the same chapter and the, uh, he, what he did as soon as he came let's read from 20 then the beast was captured and with him false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest these are the people who joined him the rest were killed with the sword which pierced from the mouth of him who sat on the hawa horse this is a symbolic language clear but clearly tells us what is the sword that's going from his mouth his word how is it killing that is talking about new birth Paul says I was crucified with Christ buried with Christ we were dead with Christ and rose again from dead with Christ it is about death of the old man and the new new birth of the new man that is how this king is going to establish his kingdom so Jesus establishes his kingdom 
through his incarnation by shedding his blood he became king and again he is going to shed his blood in the sense i mean symbolic way uh, it is expressed in book of revelation through shedding of the blood only what i meant to say is people who are living now we are saved by the shedding of the blood of jesus 2000 years ago people who lives during the apocalypse time they are also going to be saved by the shed blood 2000 years ago which was shed and with his word he is going to rule the kingdom and uh, we are we are, jesus is not going to use violence or politics these are the temptations jesus got i explained previously how jesus was tempted how politics and mob tempted jesus to become the king and establish his kingdom he is not going to use that he is going to use his peaceful love and message again and violence is not uh, the solution for violence and especially not with christ he is not going to use that and paul the and jesus won the victory with his own love one particular point i would like to preach and uh, close how this jesus the king who even who is going to establish his kingdom with his word in the days to come and how is he can be the king of our world that also we need to understand we all know that jesus is the one who was crucified as the king and he established his kingdom through his incarnation and uh, we know paul was preaching in the book of acts at the end he was preaching in the roman city in in the city of rome preaching jesus is the lord which means caesar is not the lord jesus is the lord which means jesus is, paul is preaching jesus is the king of this world he is not saying jesus is king of my world or jesus is the king of my heart we are we have grown quite a bit in saying jesus is the king of our own hearts okay but we also need to recognize that gci india we need to recognize jesus is the king of the world also how can we know him as king of the world how can we experience him as king of the world the answer is clearly given at the end of the gospel that is matthew chapter 28 verse 18 where jesus said and jesus came to them and said all authority has been given to me all authority is given to me in other words everything is under me i am the king of everything i have the authority over everything i am the lord of everything so how can you experience him as the king of everything king of the world by doing what he said us to do what did he say all the authority has been given to me on earth and in heaven not just in one place everywhere authority has been given to him and uh, peter says jesus is seated at the right hand of the father almighty and uh, stephen says he is standing at the throne of god he is already sitting in the throne john says that the lamb is sitting on the throne we sang the song worthy is the lamb seated on the throne but think apocalypse the moment we want to see lion sitting in on the throne isn't it that is the picture we get but on the throne only lamb is going to sit not the lion so what am i trying to say is the uh, he is going to establish kingdom not with violence again i don't want to go back and repeat but the thing is he is going to use only his word and how are we going to experience his kingdom by doing what he said what is that go therefore make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to do everything that he god what jesus has commanded and he promised us that he will be with us even to the very end of the age so if you want to experience jesus as the king of the world do it any time you want you miss the presence of god you go and talk to somebody about presence of about jesus immediately you will feel the presence of god any time you want to experience the power of god i'm telling you this definitely works with for 200% you go talk to somebody about jesus you will experience the power of god you want to experience the lordship and kingship of jesus go and talk to people about jesus then definitely you will experience uh, the power of god because jesus is the king over the world not like these sheep shepherds who brought violence and killed and all he is not going to bring his kingdom by killing people he is going to bring his kingdom by shedding his own blood and 
with his own the word of his mouth he is going to establish his kingdom his name is the word of god his sword comes out the sword comes off it is his mouth is the word of god his clothes are dipped in his own blood so that we don't need to shed any more blood and he doesn't shed anyone's blood and he conquers the earth by shedding his own blood and he is the king of kings and lord of lords and he is never an emperor last point i'll share and close <laughs> jesus always called as king of kings lord of lords now never as emperor caesar was an emperor right we have heard about empires darius was an emperor uh, alexander was an emperor why not jesus we say emperor means king over many nations emperor doesn't means just king over many nations emperor is someone i take authority over you and you have to do everything i say whatever you have it belongs to me and he who oppresses those are emperors king is not an emperor king is the relationship of the king and his subjects is like the sheep and the shepherd and jesus is the king he is not the emperor even in the days to come all the nations are going to be subjected to his kingship he is not going to remain as emperor so as we are commemorating the christ the king sunday let us be reminded jesus is not just the king of our hearts jesus is the king of the world as well and we experience his kingship when we go and share his word and he establishes his kingdom by sharing the word and conquers the world by sharing the word thank you